Well, good morning and special good morning to all of our mums here and all of those online watching. Happy Mother's Day. And this year, we're doing it a bit different. Normally, we would um, purchase gifts for all you mums. You would be able to enjoy flowers or gifts or whatever. But this year, we've made a decision to do it a bit different. We have decided to take all of those, that hundreds and hundreds of dollars we would have spent on doing that, and actually, we're going to donate it. Specifically, we're going to donate it to um, Young Lives Tempe. And Young Lives Tempe, it's part of Young Lives, specifically serves teen single moms. And those teen single moms and teen pregnant-to-be moms, uh, the program that they do, they have mentors and programming and help and support for all of them. And so on behalf of all the moms at Grace, we approached them and said, we want to donate what we would have given in gifts to our moms. We want to donate that funds to your moms. And they have a camp in the summer up at uh, Williams for the moms and their babies. And they get to go and they get to have time together and some coaching and some mentoring and they get to meet with Jesus as part of all of that. And so our donation this year gets the scholarship mums to go and be able to do that this year. So that's what we're doing. Um, so mums, that, that's your gift. You get to gift other mums uh, this year. And we think that's, that's really, really valuable and, and lifelong. The flowers we would have given you would have been pretty, but they'd have died. You know, but we, we felt that would be a much better thing to do. So, uh, so grateful we get to do that. We're in this series called Unstuck. If you were not with us last week or you've not heard last week's message, please take the time to go and listen to it because it laid a foundation for the whole series. And so it will help you in future weeks. Um, but I won't repeat too much of last week, but just to say this. We're doing this series because I've encountered many, 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 many people not outside the church, in the church, and outside the church, who are stuck. They're stuck in an aspect of their life. And yet when we look at the Bible, it is clear that the way the Lord views us is not in little compartments that, oh, it's just the spiritual side he's interested in. It's everything. And the word soul even means everything. It's physical, emotional, relational, and mental. It's all spiritual. And we find ourselves stuck in one of those arenas of life, and yet it's deeply spiritual. So maybe there's a physical thing, or relational, or mental, or emotional, and, and we find ourselves stuck, and we think, oh, I'll try and fix it. It's all spiritual. And so that's the series. And so we last week said, identify maybe an area of your life you are stuck. And why am I stuck? Why do I find myself getting unstuck and stuck again? Unstuck, stuck again. I'm going to talk about that quite a bit today. But the theme for today, I'm going to almost give you the end at the beginning. Because today, I'm going to ask you a key question that Jesus actually will ask in the text. We'll get to it. And that is this. Do you want to get well? Do you want to be unstuck? Do you want to? Like, Really? It's one thing saying, oh, I wish I wasn't like this. But do you want to get well? Do, are you prepared to do whatever it takes to not be stuck, to get well, to be healthy in whatever arena of life is not healthy, right? Do you want to? You think, just a dumb question, Des. No, it's not. It's a big question. Do you want to stop being angry at that person? that's holding you back and getting you stuck? Do you want to? Are you prepared to, is there some letting go there? Do you want to do that? It's a really deep question. It's important. Jesus even asked it to one particular guy we'll go to today. But in this series, the main thing to understand is this, Romans 12, 1 and 2. I think it's on the screen. Therefore, in view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as living sacrifices holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Do you see there's everything in there. It's physical, relational, emotional. We're to offer our bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. Now, today, we're going to go to a particular 
encounter that Jesus has with somebody in John chapter 5. We're gonna, I'm going to go verse by verse through nine verses, going to walk us through it, give us the context, the culture, the history, the meaning, interact with it, almost try and take us there. And then you're thinking, what's this whiteboard for? Then I'm going to apply this, and what does that mean today? What does it mean in May of 2021 when it comes to me and you finding ourselves stuck? And there's something really key that's going to help. John chapter 5, if you've got a printed Bible, the New Testament really is like the last 20% or so of a printed Bible. I think there's Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. If you see the book of Acts or Romans, take a left. And so you'll find John. He's one of the biographers of Jesus' life that the Lord inspires. And John reveals this particular encounter one day in chapter 5. I'll go verse by verse. We're going to journey with it. Are you ready? It's on the screen if you haven't got a Bible with you to follow along. Sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for a feast of the Jews. Which feast? Doesn't really tell us. Could have been Passover, could have been Pentecost, could have been Tabernacles, could have been a whole bunch of them. But either way, he wants us to know he's not living in Jerusalem. He goes to Jerusalem to hang out with the fellow Jews and party. It's a feast. It's a celebration. He's going to go. They're going to celebrate things and bring some joy. and some. So what he's making the point here is it's busy busy. There's some energy there, and he wants us to know that there's the context. Now, in that context, he goes to verse 2. Now, there is in Jerusalem, near the Sheep Gate, a pool in which, in Aramaic, is called Bethesda, and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. Okay, this is not unimportant. This is important. So there they are, they're in Jerusalem. When uh, in the book of Nehemiah in the Old Testament, I think it's chapter 10, there's a description of the rebuilding of the walls of Jerusalem that have come down. And there is these 10 gates that are defined. They build 10 gates. They've all got different names and they all have a purpose. And the name of the gate relates to its purpose. So for example, some of them are, there's the fish gate, there's the horse gate gate, there's the water gate, there is the dung gate, and then there is a sheep gate, and there's many more. The purpose of the sheep gate was where the sheep would go into the city of, because those sheep would be used for food and for sacrifice. Okay, there's the purpose. Now it said there's a location, sheep gate. Hello, what was Jesus called? The Lamb of God. There's some connection going on. He comes in, the supreme sacrifice, and right there, near there, is this pool of called Bethesda. The word Bethesda means house of mercy. Whenever you see the word Beth in the Bible, like Bethlehem, the word Beth is house. So Bethlehem, house of bread. Bethesda, house of mercy. That's important to know. Mercy. God's mercy is when we do not receive what we deserve. He's merciful. He's merciful. So it's called the house of mercy. There it is. And yet it's a pool where they go. And then we get the next section, which makes sense. Verse 3. Here, a great number of disabled people used to lie. The blind, the lame, the paralyzed, a great number. And especially now, it's this feast time. A great number. Why are they going? They're going there because they believe that this water, potentially, if you go in at just the right time, you may be made well. There's this hope for that. So these people go there. I'll carry on reading. Verse 5. One who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. Why do we need to know how long he's been there and how long he's been an invalid for? 38 years, right. Life expectancy in those days was not many more years than that. We don't know when he became this invalid, but either way, he is on earth practically not got that many years left. So this isn't somebody who's still got, oh, they're young, their whole life ahead of them, not many years left. So the overwhelming majority of his whole life, if not his whole life, he has been an invalid. He wants us to know that. How must he feel? He goes to this Bethesda, this place of mercy, 
Day after day after day after day, it's his routine. Years upon years upon years, he's desperate. He's discouraged. This is the way it is. This is life. He's stuck. Really stuck. This takes place, and then it uses the word invalid. You see, you may read that and think, oh, the guy was paralyzed. Because when you read further on, he couldn't get himself into the pool on time. He's paralyzed. I'm going to say not so. The word invalid here, okay, is this word asthenia in the Greek. Now, stay with me. Asthenia is related to a word of weakness. Weakness. He's an invalid. He has weakness, specifically muscle weakness, physical weakness. The word asthenia is used in the Bible a number of times, and on other occasions it relates to soul weakness. Just a general malady of weakness, not able, no strength. Even the Greek word asthenia being weakness and muscle weakness, there is a condition this day, okay, myasthenia gravis, which some people have, MG, which is this muscle weakness related to muscles and nerves, and there is a palsy likeness to it, and a severe weakness, a physical weakness. So it wasn't that he couldn't walk or he couldn't move, but he's unbelievably weak. But it's related here because there's a little connection here. It's not just about his physical body because it's used this word in different times. He's got a soul weakness. And that maybe the physical weakness came first and it's related and it's affected his whole life. Because it does, doesn't it? Physically impacts your whole life. Mentally impacts your whole life. Relationally impacts your whole life. Emotionally impacts your whole life. Spiritually impacts your whole life. And so there's this detail just slotted in there for us, which I think is amazing. Verse 6. When Jesus saw him lying there, he learned that he had been in this condition for a long time. How did he learn that? Well, he's Jesus. He just got it from the Lord. Maybe. But it's interesting. He's there. It's busy. There's a lot of people in real need, real desperation, hoping that the Lord will be merciful upon them. That's the mood of the space and the place. Jesus goes there, and for some reason on that day, there's one guy he goes for. And he goes to this guy. And somehow he finds out. Maybe he found out from somebody else and who's that guy over there and what's his story and maybe, maybe he went to the guy and went, hey, how long, dude? How long has this been going on? And maybe he said it. We don't know. We have a small interaction here that we have, but he learned, Jesus discovered then this is where this guy had been and how long he'd been like this with this weakness. And so... Jesus then does something that I think is just offensive. He knows this guy's been like this for 38 years. He's at the Bethesda pool. He's at the place where it's the house of mercy. He's there. And Jesus steps in at the end of verse 6 and says, do you want to get well? Duh! Duh! How insensitive is that question? What do you mean do you want to get well? Do you want to get well? Jesus is just not talking to his physical weakness. No, do you really want to get well? You've been like this a long time. And if you do get well, what does that mean? If you do get well, all the people helping you won't be in your life anymore. If you do get well, maybe you won't be as needy or needed. If you do get well, then fill in the blank. And I'm talking to all of us here. If you do, do you, do you really want to get well? Or are you, have you settled for this? And because this is all you know, you are fearful of anything else. You don't quite know what you're going to do and how you're going to live without this. Do you want to get well, because Jesus sees this guy's soul. 
And there's a physical thing, but there's a soul going on. And he asks a question, which well, we know Jesus can because he's genius. He doesn't go to him and go, hey, dude, I'm really sorry. Like, how can I help you? Shall I, can, can I help pick you up and take you in the pool? Really practical. Oh, wow, would you? Now, let's see what happens next in the text. Do you want to get well? He doesn't answer, yes, please. He doesn't. He answers this, sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me. No one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I'm trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. Because it was about a timing thing at the right time and order and all of that. It's like, oh, wow. Why is he saying that? Do you want to get well? It's not my fault. Not my fault. You need to know that I'm here because I want to get well, but nobody helps me. Nobody helps me. I'm left here to fend for myself. I can't get in that pool, and at the right time, I, I just get near, and because of my, my, my physical weakness, and somebody jumps in, and they're so selfish, and nobody ever helps me, and it's not fair, and why me, why me, why me, why me? He vents to Jesus, the one who is the one who can rescue him. Do you want to get well? He should have just gone, yes, now. But he comes up with all the story, revealing his soul, revealing the condition of his soul. It's a big deal. He's frustrated. Of course he is. 38 years. He's angry. He's a victim. It's not my fault. Come on now. Jesus hears that. He wants us to know that he hears that. And then in the middle of all that, like, do you want to get healthy? Do you want to be whole? There's so much more in that. Do you want to get well? Do you want that wholeness that's possible? And then he says in verse 8, he then goes on, then Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your mat and walk. At once the man was cured, he picked up his mat and walked. It does not say the man prayed, had faith, nothing. Jesus hears him in his desperation, hears his whatever he wants to call it, and then Jesus goes, get up. At some point in that interaction, I think there was a moment where Jesus and this guy connect, and that question, do you want to get well, was processed, and it was like, and Jesus went, get up. Right now, get up, take up your mat, and walk. Why did Jesus do that? In other ones, oh, your faith has healed you. I see your faith. He commends them. None of that. He's right there in his pit. Get up. Why? Well, all we know is, we don't know the full reason for this one, is, but we know enough of Jesus' behavior to know he was compassionate. He was compassionate. He showed compassion. He showed love. He showed grace. He wants to reveal his glory. But he's in the place called the house of mercy. Jesus doesn't go to him and go, okay, you want to get well? Let me help you into the pool. He could have done that. Let me say, we'll wait for the right time and anybody who gets in the way, I'll take them out. I'll, I'll, I'll whoa, no, 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 it's his turn. He, he could have done that, but he goes, we're in the house of mercy, no need to get into the water I am mercy. I am mercy. I, I'm going to give you, it's not hidden in this secret water, I am mercy. He gives him the very thing for 38 years he's been longing for. He didn't deserve it. He didn't earn it. By grace, he receives it. In that moment, he delivers it. So, you, do you want to get well? Do you want to be unstuck? Is there a pattern going round and round in your life and you just keep finding yourself stuck again? Why is this here? Why do we need to see it? Why are we doing this series? Do you want to get well? Do you want to get unstuck? Do you want to? 
but they didn't, and they didn't, and she didn't, and why me, and you don't know my story, and you don't know this, and, and all of these things, and we can blame, and we can point, and it's not fair, and all of that, and that's all very, very real. You need to be very honest and transparent about where you are, and that is perfectly okay, but do you want to get well? Or is this your existence that you're always going to have? Are you always going to carry that blame card, that victim mindset that but you don't understand where but 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 and and all of these different things and we'll call them excuses but they could be reasons because there was a rejection there was a trauma there is an identity thing going on they're all very very real but do you want to get well do you want to get well so here we go what I'm going to do today on here is share with you something I'm a visual learner share with something that I hope is going to help you because you'll visually see something and so when you find yourself in life in this unstuck journey, you sometimes need a picture that reminds you. I have sections of my life where I find myself getting stuck. And I find myself doing that and I just go, Ugh! I still find myself in certain things. And I've got stories of being unstuck. And these, these all relate. So I'm going to just describe something for you that will really help that is deeply this text and all of the scriptures as well. It's practical and it's very, very helpful. So what happens in a situation where you find yourself stuck and I say, do you want to get unstuck? And you go, yeah. So in the physical world, you may go, I want to be healthier Therefore, I'm going to make a decision. So he said, remember last week, you'll do some behavior change. You'll make a behavior change, and it's a good start. But you make the behavior change, and sooner or later, it doesn't, and you go back to where it was. It's January 1st, and by January 5th, it's over. Whatever, whatever the situation, there's this pattern there. But you make the behavior change, and sometimes people break through, but there's a reason why this doesn't work. Let me describe this for you. So, at some point, you feel guilt or shame. You do not like where you are. You do not like where the situation is, and something in you says, enough. A relationship that's just horrific, enough. A reconciliation you need to get involved with, enough. Emotionally, mentally, physically, I'm just not healthy, I'm constantly this, I need to do something about it, enough. These things come and you feel a guilt and you feel a shame. Let me just say this, these aren't always bad. These can be your friend. Humanly speaking, you get to a point where you go, enough's enough. They can drive you forward. Now, they can keep you stuck. It's what you do next from that point. But this is what we do next. We go to number two. So we think the solution to that, enough, I'm going to do it. I'm going to make a change. I'm going to make a change. I'm going to make a change. So we try harder than last time. We try harder. We try harder. Right? I'm going to make a change. I'm going to maybe get up a bit earlier. I'm going to do something a bit different, and that's okay. I'm, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it, and we try harder. And we try harder for a while, but then after a while, we, we get to number three. And when we get to number three, sooner or later, what happens after you try hard for a long time is you hit this word fatigue. I use the word fatigue instead of the word tired because fatigue for me is just a better word. It comes from the French word fatigue. <laughs> oh, je fatigue. There's something in words that describes an emotion, isn't there? Fatigue is asthenia. There's a brokenness. There's a weakness. Fatigue is just, I'm done. Not just a bit tired, but it's like, I'm worn out. I felt bad, I'm trying so hard, and then fatigue. And so the thing that comes after fatigue, sorry, I'm dancing cameraman, I'm like, what's he doing? So, and then you get to this. You quit. You quit. So here's the rhythm. So you go through this, and you think, I can't do it anymore. I tried. I'm exhausted, I quit. And then time goes by, 
And at some point, some guy gets up in church and does a series called Unstuck. And you just go, oh, man, I don't feel very good about this. And an element of guilt, and then, oh, here we go again, or it's January 1, or whatever it may be. And you just go, oh, and you feel this sense of guilt and shame again. And you go, I'm going to try harder. And you try harder for a while, and then you hit some fatigue, and then you hit fatigue, and you quit, and you go, I'm going to go there again. And run around. And <laughs> put your hands up if you can relate to this image. Look around the room, people. Look around the room. This is real. And this, I'm going to say it right now, this guy who is nameless, Jesus goes and he sees all this. It's not fair. It's not me. I'm going to get to that Bethesda place. I'm going to be in the right place. And hopefully I'll get there. And sooner or later he gets fatigued. Oh, what's the point? And there, there, 38 years. And Jesus steps in and goes, do you want to get well? Do you really want to get well? Do you want to get well? You see, you get to these points here, some of you right now, I, I can, we can relate to it in the physical. I've been through seasons in the physical where you, you think, oh, I'm going to get healthier. And it really wasn't until I was 42, nearly 43, after a major back injury, that I was 250 pounds and I was overweight and a mess. And a surgeon went, get well, do you want to? And I affected it and I got help from my wife and dropped 70 pounds in five months. But there came a point do I want to? Do I really want to do this? Do I really want to eat less ice cream? <laughs> like, really? You see, because for me, my narcotic, my comfort has always been food. My reward has always been food. My, I deserve it, has always been food. So when you make a decision and you think in the physical, this does relate when you make a decision and you go, but I know what I need to do. I need to move less and eat, move more and eat less. I was already moving less. If you want to do that, there comes a point. That means when you make this decision over here to try harder and you go, I'm going to set my alarm earlier and I'm going to go to a, a gym that's going to help me. I'm, I'm going to do this. And that alarm goes off and it's 5 a.m. and you have to get up and get ready and it's day three of your new routine. And, and you're in your bed and your bed goes, oh, stay. <laughs> you worked so hard the first two days. You deserve to be here right now. We've all been there, you see? And even your bed talks to you and says, I was created for your comfort. <laughs> My purpose in life is to provide you rest. You staying here is simply making me achieve my original purpose. <laughs> to be a place of rest. You so deserve this. The gym will be there tomorrow. Go tomorrow. And that happens, and which voice is louder? Do you want to get well? That person really messed you up. That trauma is unforgivable. Sit in that anger. Do you really want to let them go? Or do you prefer them to be punished? But all along, who's being punished? Just fill in the blank. Do you want to get well? But I have so much regret. I've made so many bad choices. I've made so, I'm just not good enough. I'm not lovable. Nobody would want me. The cycle is there. And Jesus comes to a guy who is stuck just like me. And he does something different. And what I'm going to draw on the board for you, years and years ago when I first encountered this, I can't tell you the amount of time just in my own private world where this image has impacted me and has changed my response in that moment. Okay? So, here we go. Um, I'm going to just make a bit of space for it. I'll just keep the word try there. Um, here we go. So, this represents right now, here. This is where your life is, and you're stuck. And what you want is to be not stuck, and you want your life to be here, there. I'm here, I want to be there. And somebody, do you want to get well? Yeah, I don't want to stay here. 
I want life to be there. And so what we think is the way to go from here to there is we go, I make a decision and boop, 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 boop. that's the journey. That's the trajectory. I made the decision. Let's go. It's possible. God can do that. I just see time and time and time and time and time and time again in the scriptures, that's not how he does it. You see, the victory of, the the posture of victory is also a similar posture to something else. This posture of victory is also a posture of don't shoot. Surrender. Surrender is the pathway to victory. So, this is the important bit. We make a decision. Do you want to get well? Yes. There's a faith decision. Come follow me. If any man should come after me, Jesus said, he should deny himself. Take up his cross and follow me. Oh, we need to die to self. The image of a seed in the ground coming to life. There's a burial and a death. Death is the pathway to life. That John 15, there is a vineyard, and on the vines, there's these branches, and we have to cut them off so that we can bear more fruit. There's a pruning that needs to take place. For us to go from slavery into freedom, there's a sea that has to be crossed. There's a moment of we have to still go. When God parted the Red Sea, the children of Israel still had to go. Are you going or am I? I don't know. Are you going? God is saying, come, but there's still a moment. Do you really want to leave, Egypt? Do you really want to leave? Do you want to come follow me? So this is the path. That is not the shape of the change. You see, this is what's beautiful about this. The shape of the change is a J. The J curve is actually being used. This has been scientifically proven, by the way. I'm like, yeah, it's the Jesus curve. So I'll give you an example, a side example, scientific side example. They've looked at this in studies of professional athletes. Let's take a golfer and a tennis player. A tennis player got an injury, and for them to continue to be at the top of their game in the future, the injury was caused by their serving technique. They had to change their serving technique to survive and to become stronger again and to be successful. So a coach comes and we have to biomechanically restructure the way you serve. If you don't, you're going to keep encountering this pain, and this pain means it's going to impact your game and impact your career. We need to restructure the way you serve. But they've had so much muscle memory of serving the ball millions of times that retraining the brain to serve different is not a, oh, okay, teach them the new way, I'll be fine by the weekend. That restructuring of how they're going to have a better serve goes this way. It gets a lot worse before it gets better. A lot worse. To the point where some people go, that is so painful, that is so difficult, I was better in pain than I was here. With it worse. I can't even get it in the box now. The system. I was better with pain than it was. The biomechanical restructuring in the muscle memory is so difficult. You're going to be so strong, so determined, but you have to trust the process. Trust. You have to surrender to this guy is wanting to do what's best for me with my serve. It's happened with golfers with their swing. You'll, for you to get to where you need to go, you need to swing different. And for years, they've been hitting the ball and hitting the ball in the set. And the muscle memory is so strong that to rewire that muscle memory, their game gets worse. And maybe if you're a golf guy or you follow golfers, they're at the top and all of a sudden they are terrible. And the coach is reanalyzing them and saying, we need to restructure the way you play this game. And that takes time and it gets worse. Same way with people with addictions and breaking that addiction. I make a decision. I don't want to be here. I want to be there. And there's this, this thing here. And so they go down here. Worse, worse. And they go, ah, uh-uh. ah. 
Uh, uh. And there's a journey. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. How does that come? The key difference on the J curve is who is it you're walking with? And who is it that is in you that is greater than he that is in the world? This is a Holy Spirit issue. This is a surrender issue. Because this pattern, we've all been there. But there comes a point where he comes and the Holy Spirit comes and goes, Des, do you want to get well? Do you want to get well? Take my hand. I'm going to remind you, but do you want to get well? Are you prepared to listen to me today on this? Well, I, I did for a couple of days, but the bed called me. What, what is it? Are you, are you, are you prepared to, are you, the, the empowering of the Holy Spirit in every sphere of life, this is what takes place, and it's been, re, it's been revealed throughout many, many people. Some people in this room have done Celebrate Recovery. This makes complete sense. Any 12-step recovery process. There's a moment, and it's, and then you break through, and there's this exponential change. And you know it, and you look at it, and you go, here we go. But it gives you the tools because you'll find yourself here again maybe one day. The reality is I didn't do this at 9 o'clock. Life is a series of these J-curves. Whoop, and you go, here we go. And you go, whoop, <laughs> whoop. In different aspects of your life, but you look back at them and it's testimony each time. And it could, you could be here, are you prepared to trust the Lord? But I'm going to choose, this is not working. This is, the, I'm, I, I surrender, God, I surrender. Are you really prepared to? And do you trust him? Let go. I already have. No, there's more. Really? No, there's more. Really? This thing, really? Stick with me. Because he knows this. He knows this. And there's a journey, and there's a process, and there's times where you just go, I don't like this anymore, I'm going to do this again. I don't like it anymore, I'm going to do this again, I'm going to go over here. Try hard on me. And he's faithful. And he comes and he says, do you want to get well? Do, do you really want to get well? And he, he asks that question. And you sit in this little spot under here. And it's this transformation taking place. And he's molding. And he's shaping. And he's faithful. And he places you in community with other people who are there to catch you when you fall. And to pick you up and go trust him. Trust him, come with me. You see this pattern all throughout scriptures. This is what we need to do. There's a dying to self. Trust me in this. He who loses his life will find it. The imagery is powerful, so, so powerful. I love the way Mark Batterson puts it in his book, Win the Day. He said, the reality is this here. We're living, we still make a decision, and that is in the natural. I still have to make the choice to set an alarm and get up. Whatever it may be, there's a natural. But this decision of surrender is, King Jesus, I, in my natural, will bring you all of my natural, and in so doing, open the pathway for your supernatural. It's not sit back, Jesus, just fix me. Just fix me. Take 50 pounds off me overnight, please. Give me the inspiration to work out like a complete Olympian. Help me desire kale over ice cream. <laughs> that person who completely destroyed my life, get rid of them. Whatever the posture is, it's like, no, come on now. Do you want to get well? Should we work? Come on now. There is life. You see, the thief comes to steal and to kill and destroy. And he keeps reminding you of this all the time. But I have come that you may have life in all its fullness. But do you trust me? Do you trust me? Surrender is a big, big, big thing with all of this. So where are you stuck? Where do you find yourself seasonally getting stuck? What patterns are there? What behaviors are there? It's physical, mental, emotional, relational. Maybe it's anger. Maybe it's an identity thing. You just think you're not lovable, not good enough. All these different things are all patterns. They're all there. And there's guilt and there's shame, but you can lean in to the one who said, hey, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Come now, come now. 
For the law of the spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death. Come with me. Do you trust me in this? There's a way forward. And he leans in and he is gentle and he is patient. And sometimes he's just a good old coach and goes, what are you doing? Come on now. Oh yeah, oh yeah. And it's often we just get in this spot here. But there's a story that can be told and a testimony that can be shared. Jesus is calling you up. And the way up is surrender. Here's the beauty of surrender. The posture of surrender isn't necessarily this. The posture of surrender is always bowed, have you noticed? Throughout all cultures and all history, when you came into the presence of a royalty or a leader, the posture of the, of the servant was always, always this. The human being, biomechanically, was wired to humble themselves in front of someone greater, in front of the master. It's how dog trainers do it with dogs. It's the idea. Um, we're not so good at that. But anyway, moving on. So you've got this whole, I need to recognize who the master is. There's a humble posture. Humility and surrender is always there, a bowing. Then you see throughout all faith systems, there's different postures of prayer, but there's a connection with the human being kneeling, bowing. There is something there about, the Apostle Paul, Ephesians 4 even says, therefore I kneel before the Father, from whom all of heaven was created, I kneel before. There is a, there's a surrender to it. It's, oh, how great he is. I know some of you maybe physically can't kneel anymore. If you can, you can't get up. But either way, kneeling, there is something about surrender. There's a beauty to surrender when we kneel. At different times when we kneel, it's I'm talking about surrender. Your heart kneeling and the surrendered posture. And there's a moment, guys, isn't there, where you have this posture? You kneel to one and you have a humble posture. You're saying, I, <laughs> you are king. No, I'm not this, anyway. This, there's a posture of my everything. I'm prepared to be less. John the Baptist said, he must increase, I must decrease. There's a posture of kneel and expression. When's the last time you kneeled before the Father? When's the last time you knelt before the King? When's the last time you went, it's enough? It's enough. Help. It's enough. I want to come back to you. Help me. Please help me. To be exalted high in victory requires us to be bent low in surrender. And do you trust him? But how long for? Trust him. Even if you don't see a breakthrough, a day, a week, a month, a few years, do you still trust him? Shadnat, Rishak, Shadnat, Meshach, and Abednego there. Even if God does not deliver us from this fiery furnace, Nebuchadnezzar, even, even, we believe he can, but even if he doesn't, we will not bow to you. Even if, trust, trust. Where are we at with that? Or we just, I trust, I trust, I trust. I, it's not going the way I wanted it to go. Whoop. I'll go back to the pattern of this world. All the best with that one. So that leads us as a land of playing with this question. Do you trust him? And do you hear him saying to you today, do you want to get well? Do, do you want to break this cycle? Because you need my Holy Spirit living and breathing in you. And you need to surrender to the one who really loves you who has mercy in abundance. Oh, and by the way, his mercy is new every morning. Every morning, great is his faithfulness. That was written in the book of Lamentations. What's the posture of lament? Tears. And in the book of Lamentations, it says, oh, and his mercy is new every morning. Great is his faithfulness. That's where it came from a spot when life was not here. It was definitely here. So here's your faith step. And this is what's challenging you. Do you really believe, could Jesus really help you? Could he really heal me? 
could he really help me get unstuck? Could he really? Because I'm scared to go there, because what if he doesn't? I've already had so many rejections and so many disappointments, I can't take another one. Could he really help? Could Jesus re... When Jesus says to the guy in Bethesda, do, do you want to get well? I think it was a really question. I've been here for 38 years. What do you mean? What do you mean? So it's surrender. It's surrender. So I'm going to create an opportunity this morning for some of you who've been on the cycle of guilt, shame, try harder, fatigue, and I quit. And you find yourself there again. And this year, this season we're in, we're going to help with unpacking in the future weeks some new ritual, some new rhythms, some new habits that help us when we're here. Because this is a season and a time that help us unpack that. Why does he say, remember me in communion? Why did there so many things to help in that journey? But it starts with surrender and trust. Take a step. Faith is not believing in God. Faith is believing God. Believing God. It's the beauty of faith. So I'm going to pray for all of us right now for a posture of surrender. But then in the closing song, which we've not done for months, which is build my life, I will build my life upon your love. It is a firm foundation. During that song, I'm going to ask for some of you where what I've talked about today is so visceral, you need to take a step physically and I want you to use this space down front to come and kneel if you physically cannot kneel just come down front and have a bow posture it's fine but to come and have an act of surrender I want to invite all prayer partners and leaders to come down left and right and then when we're done to make sure these people are prayed with but in the song there's a posture of do you know what enough maybe it's an anger maybe it's an addiction Maybe it's physical, relational, emotional, spiritual. Maybe you've got a bunch of doubt. Maybe a bunch of regret. And that word shame is gripping you. Whatever it is and you're stuck, Jesus said, I've paid for it. You don't necessarily think you deserve it. Okay, you cannot earn it, but it's what I've done for you. It's not based on what you need to do. It's based on what I've done for you. Now will you receive, come follow me. Come follow me, come with me. Let's pray together. King Jesus, I give my life to you today. That my life may be your life. I pray for all my friends in the room here today that we, Lord, we, we first of all, we confess. We confess that we try to fix we. We confess our trying harder, our fatigue. We quit. We feel guilty. But Lord, we want to step off that never-ending cycle and trust you. We want to embrace the image that you, King Jesus, the J curve of transformation. And so therefore, in view of God's mercy, we offer us our bodies as living sacrifices holy and pleasing to you, Lord. We say we do not longer want to conform to the pattern of this world, but we want to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Be the voice louder in my heart and in my soul. Come, transform my mind. Help me, I trust you. I choose to follow you. I repent of all me and give me to all of you. In Jesus' name, amen. During this last song, I, I want to encourage you, many of you, as an act, just, just come down front during the song and I posture before the Lord of surrender. Lord, I trust, I trust you and I'm prepared for it to get worse because I know what is to come. And then at the end of that, prayer partners, you come down as well during this time, left and right, elders as well, and leaders and staff. And then we can pray for the people who are surrendering this morning. We're tracking?
Yeah? Okay. Let's all stand so you can make room for people getting out left and right. And just come down front, spread out, and kneel or bow.